What is up guys, welcome back to my continued trek through Mushoku Tensei Jobless Reincarnation, the novel series, volume four. We are now chapter five of the novel series, and as I said before, pretty much follows everything that the anime adaptation sort of did, but at the same time, so much lost in its move to anime format. And it's funny because it is one of those things where honestly, as I always state, I don't mind the changes that they make when they adapt. Honestly, the novel's still here, and I'm loving the fact that I get nuggets of information addition. But there are some cases where it's like, wow, that was a little bit more brutal than the anime adaptation, which, in a sense, adds a little context to what Rudius is going through. The things that he's actually witnessed that I think shapes a person, but... We'll get into that as we get into it, but yeah, starting off with chapter 5, let's jump right into it. Where we left off in the last chapter is Rudis has just arrived at Zamport. He knows very quickly that the Zamport layout is similar to the Windport, but there's a lot of things different here. Obviously, going from the Demon Continent, where it's very desolate, there's not much stuff there, there's a lot of demons there. Whereas at Zamport, you see that there's the availability of certain resources <laughs> and materials. There's a lot more wooden structures. A lot of things are painted probably to kind of fend off the salt damage. There's more greens, less whites, grays, and browns. There's a forest at the edge, which again, <laughs> I think besides the uh, petrified forest, there's not much in the demon continent in regards to that. And obviously there's more humans here. There's more beast folk. There's more dwarves, more havelings, more people that look like humans, not lizard people and stuff. And a lot of the demon people that you would see on the demon continent. Now, of course, arriving here, he's got a job to do. Of course, they just smuggled Rajurd. He's off where the smugglers are at but of course he can't move out during the day so he's got to wait until nighttime unfortunately there's not many rooms available at the time everything's kind of booked up and this of course is because of the whole rain coming in the rainy season was upon them like i mentioned before <laughs> Elinase was not technically lying, saying that the rain was coming in. They wanted to rush through the Mills continent. This is a rainfall that lasts three whole months. It made traveling through the Great Forest impossible. The highways were very impassable. And additionally, the rain washes a lot of the monsters to the city itself. A lot of adventurers book up places in the Zant port just so they can take on jobs to fight back these monsters. They make a pretty penny for it. So that leads Rudius to pretty much the only place that they can stay <laughs> is the lodging in the slums. It's not the greatest places ever, but Eris seems okay with it. It's kind of one of those funny chemistries that you get between these two characters. Eris, who grew up in a noble family, very prim and proper family. And then here's Rudius, who, you know, lived pretty comfortably, but at the same time, he's the one complaining and not the girl that's from the noble family. You would think the girl from the noble family would be all about, ew, everything's gross, everything's dirty. But no, she's just, again, I think it's that, <laughs> that geese lane getting in her, that tomboy aspect getting into her to where she's like, Stop being a crybaby. <laughs> I like, this is fine. And yes, this is technically the same girl that he caught sleeping on the top of Roach and Fess's hay <laughs> at her own home. Th now there's a saving grace to Rudius. If you do think about it, he's technically from another world and he kind of craves that warmth of the, his previous life, the warm bed that he once enjoyed in his previous life. So yes, technically to our today's standard modern settings, this is a lavish lifestyle that we live in in our modern times compared to essentially a more medieval setting where most people live, yes, technically on hay. This is where Rudius kind of talks a little bit about what his pattern is whenever he does get a place to stay. He always uses like this hot wind to both kill dust mites and other rodents, but at the same time, it allows him to clean the room and discover if anything was left behind previously. He says that he finds a lot of things that people drop or leave behind in their rooms that he can sell for a pretty penny. This is where Rudius tells Edis that he's gonna leave off through this job. She's gonna go with him, but he's like, no, we need to have somebody stay here because we're in the slums and somebody can break in and steal our stuff. Apparently this has happened before. But Edis is like, no, there's nothing really to steal. We don't have anything of value for them to steal. And Rudius is like, well, they could steal your underwear. And he's like, no, you only do that. <laughs> Sick burn. <laughs> So yes, Rudius leaves and he goes to this one location where he's supposed to meet the guys to go to the place where the smugglers are going and keeping all their goods. It's kind of funny because the first person he meets, he has like this password that he's supposed to say, but the guy kind of looks at him like, what? <laughs> and then he mentions that he's with Gallius and everything like that. And so they're like, oh, okay. It seems like based on his age and look, they he was like, what the heck are you doing here? They take these tunnels and they go all the way out. It takes them pretty much outside of Zantport all the way to this villa outside. They make a little note about the fact that the upper floors of this villa are kind of just for show. They don't keep anybody up there. Eventually, Rudius is kind of taken around. He does note this one dog that's being kept in this one room. And eventually he's taken to where Rajurd is at. And this is kind of funny because of course it's been a while <laughs> and Rajurd's been locked up in here. And so yes, his hair is growing back. Guys are pretty terrified. They know that exactly that he is a superb at this point. There's no, there's no, oh no, he's just a bald. He can't be a superb. No, they 
they're pretty sure this guy's a bird now. Rudis goes in there. The guy's like, don't unchain him in here. Take him out of here before you let him loose because we don't want him in here going berserk. Richard calls to him and he gets up close. The guy's like, don't do that. He's going to bite your ear off or something like that. And he's like, no, I got this. I, I have this guy under control. And so Richard reveals to him that they have seven children under their captivity. These are beast folk children. They kind of assume, okay, so this must be the cargo that they want us to rescue. And obviously, due to this, Richard's like wanting to kill them all. And... Rudis is like, you know, I kind of was hoping to do this kind of stealthily, rescue the children, get them out. Nobody will notice kind of thing. But at this point, you really can't hold reserve back. So Rudis only has really one demand. Like, we have to make sure that they're all gone. If any of them stay alive, they'll be hunted down by somebody. You don't betray a smuggling organization and just get away all willy-nilly. They, they have these assassins they train from birth that will be sent out to get you. Rudis is also noting the fact that Rajard's been pretty calm lately. Like this is the first time he's seen this bloodthirstiness of Rajard in a long time. So of course he's curious like what what do these guys do? And Rajard's like no you'll know when you'll see them. And it's kind of sad because Rajard is telling Rudis like he knows that Rudis is a little hesitant. And he's like you don't have to worry. You don't have to dirty your hands. I'll handle this. And it sort of hits Rudis <laughs> like thorns. Rudis tells him no I'm on board. He believes that Rajard kind Kind of misunderstood his apprehension. Rudius has killed so many things. He's taken out so many beasts, but taking a life is something completely different. He's sort of realizing at this point, yeah, I, I want to help. I think this is the wrong thing, but he doesn't believe that he'll be able to take the life of a human, essentially murder them. But Reserve sort of knows this. He knows his apprehends him. He, he's not misunderstanding him. He knows that he doesn't want to take a life. He says, no, your hands are for protecting Edis. And that's the funny part, because he, he removes the shackles for Richard, and the guy's like, what are you doing? You can't do that, he's gonna go crazy. And he's like, don't worry, he'll listen to me, but he'll still go berserk anyways. And yeah, in a split second, takes out that guy, single strike, goes down the hall, he can hear people screaming, the superb's been loose, everybody's screaming bloody murderers, obviously going around killing everybody. And that's where we get into chapter six. I <laughs> admittedly... Wasn't too happy with this chapter. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna come out clean. Don't hit the dislike yet. Just hear me out. This is honestly the first time where I can't defend Rudius. I've never been able to, de to defend Rudius, honestly. It, but it's always been one of those things where you always see like he does something pervy or whatever, and you're like, yeah, he's he's that's him. That's that's Rudius. That's his past self still stuck in him. But there's sometimes where it's like I can't. I hate it still. Like, I still hate it. Like, I've been apologetic for this series for a long time. I've been defending it for a long time. Always the the mindset that this is a redemption story. And he's going to fall. And he's going to do stupid things. I never ask people to uh, to accept Rudius for who he is. It's just accepting that Rudius, hopefully, over his time, will mature and get better. But it's hard to get through this section because this is one of those cases where you have, like... The most innocent of innocent, and they're they're chained up and they're beaten and bruised, and he cannot stop thinking about it. And it's like, please stop thinking about it. <laughs> but yes, Rudius, while everything's happening, he goes to the room where the children are being kept. He says that there's seven children here, they're naked, and they have beasts and they have elf ears. There's three boys and four girls. He says the third boy is actually injured and on the floor. Knowing that he's probably the worst off, he goes immediately to him, heals his wounds. He has to end up burning the gag off his face because it's so tight. He then sends the three boys to go guard the door. They're a little bit hesitant, but he's like, you know, your your job, you're a boy. You, your job is to protect the girls. Go there and tell me if anybody's coming. This is where he goes around and he heals all the rest of the children. And yes, <laughs> he has to make a comment about the fact that, hey, look, I have to touch in order to heal. And yes, I had to just touch one of their chests. But he claims that he wasn't doing anything inappropriate. During this whole situation, he keeps pointing out there's this one very strong will girl that's in the group she has cat ears and she keeps glaring at him and he also kind of notes the fact that she's sort of the one with the most bruises probably kind of indicating this is the one girl that was always trying to defend or maybe fight back she had a lot of guts in her to assess the situation he asked this one particular girl why were they being kept there it's sort of funny <laughs> their demeanor and everything he's sort of starting to compare her to edis <laughs> Almost like he's trying to compete the two of them and talking about how Eris is better at this and whatnot. It's like he's got these two girls and he's trying to say, oh, well, Eris is so much better or whatever. She sort of points out the fact that they were out playing in the forest and some strange man came by and grabbed them. And yes, she said Mew at the end, <laughs> which totally, which totally throws him off guard. A Mew, a genuine Mew. 
Not like Eris's imitation, a genuine Mew. And he's so stuck on this. He's like, no, I know it's not part of the beast tongue. She literally said specifically Mew. And yes, he badly wanted to touch her inappropriately. Again, I can't, I can't defend this guy. He, it agitates me. Honestly, it agitates me. I'm laughing, but it agitates me. This is one of those points where it's like, come on, Rudius. Don't fall back into that. It's not a good situation to be doing that in. This isn't a funny situation. But I think it's a genuine thing. Like, his mind's still going to run where it runs. I, I'm not going to apologize for it, but I, I'm, I still understand that his mind's going to run where it runs. He's still an idiot perv, even if the situation itself is not a, a happy one. Now, I will say that I'm a little bit glad that, if I remember correctly, the anime specifically says that one of the children was dead. None of the children are dead here. One was on the floor, and he healed him, but none of the children are dead here. So I think, it, so it'd be much more, I would be extremely upset if this, one of them was dead in this one. Now, it is an important thing to note here because she specifically, because this cat girl specifically says that they were captured and taken, he feels a little bit of relief, realizing that it's a lot more difficult for him to justify what they're doing if they were children that were sold by their parents. I would say that I would still be angry about it, but still, it at least doesn't make it out to their basically stealing goods, but that they are in fact rescuing children that were taken against their will. They were saving people. At this point, Richard returns. He knows that the children can't leave as they are. They need to get them clothing, get them wrapped because it's too cold outside. And yes, respecting their privacy. So the two of them go around and they search for some clothing. And this is where it gets a little bit more darker. I, and this is where I was saying earlier, where I think based on what Re Rudius kind of experiences, it technically molds him as a person. And some of the gr gruesome things he's obviously going to have to face is important to his build and his maturity. At some point, he looks out the window and he notes there's a pile of these smugglers out in the front of the building. Like, Rajur went around and killed all these guys and just piled them all up the front. And Rudius realized, you know, I kind of need to get rid of these bodies so they have no evidence. So he goes out there and he starts to dictate, oh, what am I going to do? And he decides that he's going to set it all on fire, kind of burn all the bodies. He's noting at this point that every single one of them looked like they were killed by a single blow, which again, kind of gives credit to Reserve's skill. He decides to use a very large flame so that he can kind of combat the smell that's obviously going to come from this big pile of burning corpses. As he's casting the spell, he realizes that he accidentally set fire to part of the, the villa, so he has to use some water magic to put it out very quickly. And Reserve comes out, he's already had the children with them, they're already cloaked. He used some curtains around the building to kind of cover them up. And one of the children speaks up. Ask them if they've seen the dog. They said, yes, we've seen the dog. Well, why didn't you rescue it? Well, you guys came first. No, this dog is very important. So Rudius is like, you know, I'll, I'll go back. I'll get the dog and I'll bring him out. Rajurd, you head to the city first and just wait for me outside the city. And he's like, I, I just think it's going to be a very terrible idea if Rajurd, again, he's growing his hair back, <laughs> walks into the city with a bunch of children. It's going to look bad. And with how bad Rajurd is at communicating, it's not going to end well. He is sort of trying to figure out, you know, what is the next steps? He honestly doesn't really know. He, he's like, he hasn't really thought about that far. Are we going to take him to the guild? Are we going to take him to the garrison? Additionally, for the smugglers, what is he going to do with that? Is he going to pin the blame on somebody else? He even considered the idea that he would write on the side of the villa, the demon, <laughs> the, the demon world's great emperor, Kishirika, was here. <laughs> he said that she did technically say that he could rely on her for anything, so... <laughs> Why not pin the entire blame of all this situation on her? <laughs> Eventually, he finds the dog, goes in there, realizes it has a sort of circle around it that's keeping it still. He can't get close to it. He says that any time he tries to get next to it, he has like this sharp pain. Eventually, he recalls back to Roxy talking about how everything like this sort of needs some sort of mana to supply it. So he looks around for this crystal, goes to the upper floor, ends up finding this lantern, takes it out. Sure enough, comes back down. The dog is free. The dog growls at him at first, but he realized really quickly this dog seems to understand what he's saying. He's very obedient. But as he goes to get take off the collar, it's trying to get away. He's like, no, you need to calm down. Eventually releases it. The thing jumps around right top of him and starts licking him like crazy. And at some point he realizes, man, this, this fur is really good. Might as well take advantage of the situation. And then, yes, that's when... <laughs> Geese shows up, one of the beast men that shows up. He realizes that this guy is going to attack him. So he immediately has like, tells the dog, come on, get up. I have to get up. He goes to get up on his feet. And he goes to use his eye. But all he can see is this guy's going to yell at him. And sure enough, when he shouts, he gets paralyzed. Like he can't move. Is it Geese or Geese? I think it's, I think it's Geese because there is a Geese. Geese lifts him up and is talking about how... <laughs> He tells the chief guy, like, this guy was touching the sacred beast with a pervy look on his face. The entire time, like, he's having a conversation with the sacred beast. He's, like, he's talking to the sacred beast about what happened, and the the sacred beast is just going, woof. And he's just having this long conversation, but Rudis is, like, pointing out, 
mean, you know, they're having a conversation, but the dog's only saying wolf. This old guy shows up, tells him, you know, look, I smell the scent of Torna. She was here. She's gone now. We need to go look for him. He tells Gaius, you know, look, take this boy back to the village. Take the sacred beast with you. If he's part of the smugglers, we'll interrogate him there. Guys, Gaius mentioned the idea that he had, he smells uh, sexual excitement within Rudius, which... <laughs> He's like, that wasn't for the dog. It was because I was in a room with a bunch of naked cat girls and stuff earlier. But yeah, Gaius takes him and the sacred beast and they run off towards the forest. From here, we jump to a perspective from Rajurd, which was kind of interesting. I think in the anime, all we really got was like a brief little snippet the moment that Rudius woke up in front of Edis and Rajurd in the anime. It really did feel like they just kind of skimmed over everything that happened between the moment that he left Rajurd to the moment they ran into him at the sit in the village. But it's really cool because it gets a little bit more perspective of Rajurd and his conflicts that he really faces in taking these children to the city. He realizes that Rudius has taken a long time. It shouldn't have taken this long to go in there to get the dog and then follow them. He's sort of wondering, you know, what if what if I miss something? I couldn't have missed anything. I can I could see the entire area area. I took out every single person, every living being in the area I took out. But he's sort of wondering if maybe reinforcements came in and he ran into those reinforcements. He's like, no, he's very resourceful. He'll figure out a way to get out of the situation. But what if they turn the tables on him? He, again, no, again, noting the idea that Rudius has never taken a life. And he feels like Rudius would probably, if he was put in that situation, that would turn the tables against him. He wouldn't be able to take that life to get away. But he's still trying to push himself. Like, you know, I, I kind of trust him. I, I trust that he's going to know what to do. He's not a child and he can handle himself. And thankfully, in his situation that he's in right now, he doesn't have Edis to worry about. So he can, again, be a little more resourceful. But he figures Rudius right now doesn't need his worries. He needs to focus on what he's doing. But at the same time, he can't really continue into town with all these children. Even he notes that would probably end badly. He's talked about how he's faced issues like this before where he's saved children from merchants, slave merchants before. And upon returning to the city, he only got turned into the captor itself. Everybody just claimed that he was the captor and then came after him. But even if he did shave his head again, if wore an eye patch over, or something over his eye, he probably think that he would still be bad with words. At this point, we learn about the fact that that dog is actually the sacred beast. One of the children apologized to Rajurd, says, you know, look, that dog is very important. It's been a long time since Rajurd has used beast tongue, but he sort of has the general sense of it. This is the point in which Rajurd realizes there's some sort of force coming towards him. Something's coming at them very, very quickly. So he stands on guard in front of the children. And just before this person arrives just before him it stops this is the same beastman that ran into rudius earlier he's standing there with a hatchet in hand but thankfully one of the children ran forward and greets him <laughs> so reserved is able to kind of at least drop his guard a little bit but obviously despite the fact that one of these children run forward and tells him no look this guy saved us the guy bows to reserved and thankful of him but he's still a little bit on guard and reserved can kind of sense this and it's just because reserved at, at face value isn't happy he thinks to himself no warrior would allow these children to be taken. But upon realizing that these guys were actually out searching for these children, they kind of regained his respect. They didn't stand by. The man introduced himself as Gustav Dodolia. And knowing the children can't really travel at night, go back to the village, they decide they're going to go back to Zantport. And so Rajurd, along with Gustav, head towards there. Rajurd, obviously, at this point, realizing, you know, I need to get back to Edis as well. You know, Rudius would want me to take care of her during this time. But Rajurd does ask him, did you see a child back at the villa? I said, yes, we found this, <laughs> this pervy looking kid touching the sacred beast. And Rajurd asked, did you kill him? In his own mind, he's really thinking, like, if this guy took out Rudius, no matter the circumstances, I would get revenge for him. He would wait until this Gustav guy got the children back to their home, but he would kill him. But no, thankfully he says no. He's been taken back to the village. He's going to be interrogated there. We'll go back to the village and get him. It's even funny because Rajurd in his head's like, you know, yeah, I guess worst case scenario, he's took in there. He's put in a cage. He's probably stripped naked. He probably wouldn't care because he keeps telling me that if Eris seen him naked, did not worry about it. So obviously he doesn't mind being naked. This is where we open up one of the funniest chapters in this entire series. and was easily one of the funniest parts in the anime adaptation as well. As we have the free apartment in chapter seven. Hello there. My name is Rudius and I used to be a shut in. Currently, I am checking out a new free apartment that is the talk of the town. No security deposit, no key payment, no rent. A one room space complete with two meals and spare time for a nap. The bed is made of bug infested straw, which is a downside. But the price is cheap. After all, the rent is free. The toilet is a large jar set in the corner of the room. Once you've done your business and the jar is filled with excrement, you'll have to dump it in a hole on the opposite side of the room. There's no running water, so it's a little unhygienic, but you can get by with a little magic. If you're a magician like me, 
who can make warm water, your problems are completely solved. There are only two mills. For modern day folk, that might be too little. Still, this food is quite incredible. A lush land's regional specialties of fruits and vegetables, meat as well. The seasoning is light, bringing out the natural flavors of the ingredients, which is enough to make anyone used to life on Demon Continent smack their chops in delight. Now for the apartment's primary feature, its security. Please have a look at these durable iron bars. You can bang on them as much as you like, pull all them as much as you like, but they won't budge an inch. Their only weakness is that they can be pried open with magic. There surely isn't a thief alive who would look at these bars and think, hey, I think I wanna go there. Yet inside they will go because this free apartment is a jail cell. <laughs> I just love it so much. It's like one of the best moments. I mean, they pulled it off in the anime really well. Like that whole like cribs thing going on with it. They should have had like the whole camera shake and stuff going along with it. But it was it was great. But it continues to get better. It's a really good chapter. Chapter seven. It jumps back and it talks about the whole travel to there. The entire time noting this dog is chasing after him. Despite this dog being pretty young, it seems like it has a lot of energy. Eventually they arrive there and Gius tells the dog to go back to their home. With Rudius still being held onto him, he climbs all the way top. He's, he talks about how he starts ripping off all of his clothes. And he's like, what is this guy doing to me? Again, again Rudius is paralyzed at this point. He's still paralyzed by this roar. Eventually he takes him over to the cell, throws him inside there, closes the cell and leaves him be. Kind of regaining the ability to move himself. He kind of starts figuring out what the heck's going on. Why did he take all my clothes? Why did he threw me in here? Didn't even let him talk or anything. Kind of assumes at this point that this is how the beast, you know, the beast people work. Like they, you know, stripping somebody to humiliate them to kind of ruin the captive's mind. He's, he's kind of recalling about these, you know, interrogation tactics he's heard about. That's when he starts jumping into the multiple days that he spent in the cell. Day one, a woman appears. <laughs> he tries to plea to her what happened. She dumps water on him, calls him a pervert and then leaves. And he's like, this is kind of a form of torture too. But you sort of get this sense of like, yeah, I think for Rudius, that's sort of an opposite effect. <laughs> Having this, this, you know, endowed lady showing up, putting this, you know, disgusted look at him and dumping water on him as he's naked. Day two, he starts to worry about Rajur getting there. He does end up breaking out and looking around the area that he's at into the cell, trying to figure out, plotting some way of being able to get away. He does note that even if he were to run on foot to get away, this Gaius person is like super fast. So he probably would catch up to him. He even thought about, you know, creating a pillar to go up really high to get a vantage point in the village. But again, just kind of figures this guy will catch him anyway. So he decides to go back to his cell. Day three, he talks about how the food's really great. He tells the lady to tell the person that cooked it that it was really fantastic. And he says that based on how this guard flicked her tail and brought him seconds, he kind of assumes it was probably her that made it. And so she was a little bit pleased to hear that her food was good. Day four, he talks about how there's nothing to do. He thought about kind of sitting there and just fiddling with his magic to kind of practice a little bit, but he figures that if he does too much, they'll end up, you know, gagging him or binding his wrists or whatnot. So he decides not to. On day five, we meet Geese. Yes, the real Geese, not Gaius. I, again, <laughs> I'm probably messing up that other name. I think it's Gaius, but... Yeah, Geese shows up. Uh, this random thief, they just chuck into the cell with Rudius. Of course, the guy's like, man, why do you handle me so rough? And then he turns to Rudius and he's laying there nice and comfortable on his side. <laughs> yes, calls him newbie. What's up, newbie? Welcome to my humble abode. And again, <laughs> Geese knowing the idea, like, man, you're you're definitely something special, aren't you? It's like, what do you mean? Dude, you're like naked and you're sitting all confidently on there. But yeah, he's like, watch your mouth, newbie. I'm the I'm the master of this cell. And the guy's like, yeah, whatever, man. And Rudius in his mind's like, you know, you're probably wondering why am I why am I being so full of myself while I'm naked in front of this guy? He's like, because I'm bored. What else? <laughs> He kind of presses on Geese, try to figure out, you know, like, why are you here, dude? He's like, oh, um, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I tried to swindle some beast people with some dice and I, I got in trouble and brought in here. Why are you here? And he's like, yeah, public indecency, obviously. <laughs> I was naked and I hugged a pup. And he's like, yeah, I heard about somebody uh, inappropriately touching the sacred beast. That must have been you. At this point, he asks Geese what his name is. He says he's Geese. And Rita sort of goes, you know, I've, I, th I feel like I've heard that name before. Geese asks him who he is. He introduced himself as Rudius. And even Geese is like, you know, yeah, I, I, I felt like I've heard that name before. Which we all know why there's this connection, but we'll get into that stuff later. <laughs> it is so funny when I first watched the anime and this random thief guy shows up, I was like, well, this is a throwaway character. This is another example of me not realizing this writer doesn't just bring random people up for no reason. They're always, not that they all have to be important figures of the story overall, but they all have significance in the story in the end. 
Like, they're not throwaway characters. Now, this is a funny thing, because at this point, he asks Geese for his vest. He's like, hey, give me your vest, newbie. <laughs> the guy's like, what do you mean? He's like, man, I'm naked here. Give me your vest. So he's like, all right, whatever. He takes off his vest and gives it to him. Really quickly, later on, realizes things are like, infested with, like, bugs and stuff. So he has to, like, clean it out. At some point, Rudius asks, you know, Geese, why would you come here to gamble? <laughs> like, why why this, why the Doldia village? And Geese's response is, yeah, one of my acquaintances was uh, here a long time ago in this village. And I thought I might meet her. Which, yes, again, I, I, I don't know why I keep dancing around. Again, this is like full-on spoilers for anything that was in the anime adaptation for the first season. Eventually, yes, we'll learn that Geese was a part of Paul and Zenith's party. And yes, technically, Geese Lane was a part of that party. And... This is where Geese Lane's from. So that's obviously what he's recall what he's kind of referring to here is that he was hoping that he'd run into Geese Lane. I don't know why he'd want to meet Geese Lane. Maybe later on we'll find out why. <laughs> it seems like everybody in that party hate each other. <laughs> it seems like everybody in that party hate each other. They mostly hated Paul, but it, it seems like everybody hates Paul, but everybody seems to not like each other. I, I think they like Zenith, but I don't know. I, I haven't got any indication that they were all like the bestest friends. Like they just had their party. They work well together. And then outside of combat, they all hate each other for some reason. And yes, technically they all, according to Geese Lane, didn't like Geese at all because he was the one that was wasting their money gambling and stuff, but he was resourceful still. Anyways, at some point, Rudy says that he's trying to figure out how to escape. He's wondering if he could lead him back to the to the uh, Zantport. This guy's Geese is like, no, I don't have anything to do with it, man. He's like, no, I can break out, man. Let, let's, let's let's get a plan together. He's like, no, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. He says something effective, you know, running away doesn't help your problems, which again, Wondering if that is a passing comment for a reason, but we'll have to wait and see. And yes, Rudus even sort of contemplates this point. He thought about just like setting the entire forest on fire. That way, during the, you know, havoc, he can flee. And he's like, I would be willing to do it because, I mean, psh, these dudes had all these false accusations for me. They deserve it. That moves on to day six. He's talking about, you know, look, I can't wait any long. He's already laying out his plan. He says he's going to give about two more days and he's going to figure out a way to get out. And then moving on to day seven, we have a little short conversation between Rudius and Geese. And at some point, Rudius realizes, you know, something's not right. Like some, it seems like quiet. He doesn't really know what's going on. And that's what they realize. He looks out and he sees that the entire place is on fire. And that kind of wraps up chapter seven. I'm going to wrap it up there because this video is going on a little bit long. But uh, yeah, looking forward to talking about chapter eight. Some really good stuff in there as well. Definitely looking forward to the next part. I thank you guys for watching as always. If you did like this video, make sure to hit that like button before you leave. Leave a brief comment. It does help us out. Whatever you put down there. If you put down there, you're, you're pronouncing G G Gaius wrong. <laughs> That's fine. I'm used to people yelling at me for my pronunciations. A lot of characters to pronounce all these weird names. And then you have mixed language versions like Rudius is not technically Japanese. It's all weird. But anyways, as always, I hope you guys enjoy this video. As always, if you're new to this channel, make sure to that subscribe button so you get all my content. Additionally, if you're looking to support the channel more, we have a Patreon link, a tips link, and a super thanks button down below. Anything you can give at all is definitely appreciated. And y'all take care.